Hello everyone and welcome back. As you know, I am the Crusader Gal. I was recently struck by an article at Crisis Magazine called Appeal Appealing But Deadly, and I was well, enamored by just how candid the author was. And so I invited him on the show and he actually said yes. So uh, I'm thrilled to have him on the show today. His name is Austin Ruse. He's the longtime president of the Center for Family and Human Rights, a New York and Washington DC based research institute that works on international social policy at the United Nations primarily. His group has played a central role in blocking a global right to abortion and a redefinition of the family in international law. He's the author of hundreds of articles, essays, and columns. He's also the author of four books. So again, joining me today is Austin Roos. Thank you so much for joining me. I am delighted to be with you, Crusader Gal. <laughs> Thank you. So in this article, I mean, you were talking about Barry Weiss speaking at the annual conference of the Federalist Society and what you thought was wrong with that. Can you explain like, who she is and why that's a problem? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I want to make very clear that uh, I'm a fan of the Federalist Society. You know, Leonard Leo, who's uh, the head poobah there, is an old personal friend. Right. Um, and uh, I, I published a book called Little is Suffering Souls, Children Whose Short Lives Point Us to Christ. And one of the children that I write about was his daughter, Margaret, who uh, suffered her lifelong with, uh, with uh, spina bifida and then passed at 14. Just awesome. a remarkable story. So, so not really a criticism of the Federalist Society, but mostly about the, the face that someone like Barry Weiss presents to the world and, and, mostly to, and, and specifically to conservative circles. Um, that, um, you know, she's a married lesbian. Uh, you know, and uh, the pre what comes across is that this is perfectly normal and natural. Right. And she's accepted into certain circles. And this presents the idea to the world that this is perfectly normal and natural. And it's not. And what I say in, in the piece is that whether she knows it or not, she's a sexual revolutionary. Yes. And our our, you know, Hamas is not an existential threat to the United States. The sexual revolution is and has been for 60 years. So so she's a part of that. And insofar as we accept her into, you know, into our conferences and things like that, it makes it appear as if it doesn't really matter to us. And that's mm -hmm. a big problem, I think. Uh, I would agree. I also think it seems so unbelievably normal, though. You know, like nowadays, the idea of having somebody who is a public um, practicing homosexual, um, taking the part of a supposed conservative role is so normal that when you say yeah. anything against it, people just seem a little bit shocked because it's become just part of what what is it accepted and expected. You know, and I've been writing on this particular topic of, of this idea of, of the easygoing acceptance of this in conservative circles for some time. You know, uh, I, 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 well, we've noticed it for a very, very long time. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. It's, it's quite common. You know, the other day on Twitter, I, I, I'm not on Twitter X anymore, uh, but somebody pointed out to me that there was a kerfuffle over, um, gosh, what, some conservative homosexual. Guy Benson? Maybe it was the, yes, yeah. who, uh, you know, rented, rented, you know, rented a womb. Just a child. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and designed a baby. And um, there were all sorts of congratulations for him. Um, there was a woman uh, 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 named McGrew. I, I can't remember her first name. She reached out to me, uh, and we've been talking. She's a columnist, and and she, like you, you ought to have her on. Okay, is, is very keen on this issue. Um, uh, so so it's it's like there were all these congratulations for for him and his family and his baby, and it's as if nothing is wrong. Right. I mean, there's so many things wrong with that. You know, there's there's. You know, it, it, yes, you know, there are, renting. but it's like the natural conclusion. It's like if you're okay with, and and this is, I think there are a lot of people who are okay with having a, a public homosexual conservative, but they're not okay with that person either adopting or purchasing a child. But I think that one is the natural conclusion of the other. If it's perfectly okay yeah. and that there's nothing indecent or degenerate about en engaging in public acts of homosexuality, then therefore what's the problem with them, you know, raising children, right? And I think that's one of the things that is sort of missed is that one leads to the other. And this is in general, the trajectory that you go, you, it's a sliding scale that we're, we're kind of sl sliding pretty low at this point. But I, I do think that there's a you know, path. And, yeah. 
And as you say, there are so few people who are willing to speak out on this. I mean, uh, God bless you, Thank you. For, for willing to talk about it. Uh, you know, my old friend, Bob Riley, um, you know, ha- has written about these types of things on and off for years. I don't know if you know his work. He is uh, Robert Riley, just a, a big brain uh, in foreign policy, but wrote a very important book some years ago called Making Gay OK right. about how all of this happened. Um, and so that there are very few of us, you know, it's like I think it's really important that the few of us that are willing to do it ought to keep on doing it. Yes, yes, um, I, I agree. And I, and in general, though, what, what's happening, I think it, are people gradually refusing to talk about it and sort of ceding the issue to the peril of not only the, the children that end up getting purchased, but also the rest of society. Um, you, you mentioned that she's a, a sexual revolutionary, and I, I don't object, um, but I think it would behoove us a little bit to talk about the fact that that this is instrumental in our society because I don't think that you can, I don't think you can divorce the sexual revolution from the state of the West or the decline of the West. In fact, mm-hmm. I would argue I think that it's the sort of central, uh, the central thing wrong that everything else is merely mm-hmm. tangential to it. I, I don't. I mean, if you don't have the family as the center of society, I, I don't see how you would have anything like Christian. I don't think you could have a civilization. Your thoughts? You know, I, I, I couldn't possibly agree with you more. Uh, you know, the, the, the central issue of the last half century or more has been the, the triumph of the sexual revolution. And, you know, it, and it, it is it, it's, it's not just the sexual left that it has affected. I mean, it has affected everybody, yeah. including all the conservatives who think that there's nothing wrong with homosexuality or that we, we welcome these types of couplings into our ranks. And golly, they're good on Hamas and free speech. Um, therefore, you know, we've got to let these other things slide. And after all, there's nothing wrong with it as, uh, not that there's anything wrong with it as Jerry Seinfeld, uh, quite famously said, but I, I agree with you. I, I think that the, the heart of our problem is the sexual revolution. Now, the good news is that even some, uh, radical feminists are waking up to this. Uh, the, the, the Louise Penny, uh, Louise Perry, uh, who wrote a very important book on the sexual revolution last year. Uh, there was a reporter for the Washington Post who wrote uh, on this particular topic. So, you know, they are still willing to let the whole homosexual question slide, but they have concluded this, that the sexual revolution has been bad for women. And that's true enough. Right. But there's huge parts of it that they're not willing to address. Hopefully they, they might come to that. Yeah. You talked in your, in your article, the one that I ran, uh, mentioned, about allowing such modernists in the movement was rat poison, which I kind of I like as I think it's a helpful visual. <laughs> Could you explain that for the audience, though? <laughs> there's a there's a very smart woman that I know named uh, Rebecca Diaz Bonilla, who is an international consultant on communications, and she works with foreign governments. She's a very brilliant woman, and she gives a a, a, a lecture about family and popular culture. And she uses uh, the, the the idea of rat poison, that there are sometimes wonderful movies. The example that she gives is When Harry Met Sally, which, which is rat poison because it's a beautiful rom-com. I love When Harry, when, when Harry Met Sally. Um, but at the heart of When Harry Met Sally is infidelity. Now, a friend of mine challenged me on that the other day. But, but I mean, that's the idea, is that rat poison is rat poison because rats love it and they will go eat it and they will die and insofar as we accept certain of these ideas we're we're also eating rat poison which destroys destroys our souls in some cases pornography um and and truly harms society um i I wrote a piece in modern age called how davos man beat the family man um Mm -hmm. and and you know davos man is the only way that davos man is going to win is is by atomizing all of us. They want us to be alone because we're easier to push around when we're alone rather than sitting with, you know, 10 children around us. Um, right. And and so so part of the sexual revolution, the predicate so, for so much that's going on today is the atomization of the of of of, uh, of all of us. And it, the predicate is the sexual revolution. Right. And that I would say also that that has sort of increased 
in modern times, even past the the sexual revolution, which is not to say that it's not the foundation, um, but the isolation of people, I think, was <clears throat> has been sort of maximized. Uh, the internet has played a role in that, which you know we can do mm -hmm. these these conversations, which is great, um, without me traveling. Uh, however, at the same time, I think that it has uh, led to some exacerbation of that, and the and the understanding that this, in some way, is a replacement uh, to community, and it's not. Uh, and that was, I think, most most shown throughout COVID, where you sort of had the the replacement of of the state in, in place of any sort of community. It was, um, and so over time, as you accept that people should be alone, or that it's okay for people to uh, be alone in like a social sense, it's, it's, it's like it's counter to a person's nature, right? We're, we're social mm -hmm. creatures. Um, and I think it kind of all goes together when you look at the decline of the West. I don't think you can avoid talking about the fact that um, we're supposed to be to be social and to have communities. And we don't. So you like you erode the family, and then you erode any connections with the other families that should actually take place. You know, Mary Everstadt, who's one of my heroes, uh, wrote a book about uh, these feral children that you see uh, rioting in downtown right. Portland. You know, the, the the beginning of that is the fact is you know divorce, like a fatherhood, um, mm -hmm. that they don't have any brothers or sisters or aunts or uncles. And you know, you go out and you find community. And she said one of the targets of uh, the feral children in, in Portland was from time to time actually invading suburban neighborhoods and protesting in front of the homes of families. And 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 part of their anger, wow. a huge part of their anger, is the fact that you know they're they're fatherless, they're uncle-less, they're aunt-less, they're cousin-less. Um, you know, I, I stepped into, you know, accidentally a few weeks ago, one of these Hamas demonstrators, I was in demonstrations, I was getting off the train in Washington, D.C., and I saw this young woman who was as angry as anybody that I've ever seen in my life. And it seemed like some sort of primal scream, which is the phrase that that Mary Everstadt uses with with regard to these yeah. children. And I, all I thought was, this is not about Hamas for you. This is this is just a cry for your father, who's probably absent. Um, and that's the sexual revolution. Yes, I know. And you know, we do see the results. I think of fatherlessness and and also of a sort of androgyny. I think it's fair to say. I think we're sort of living in a bit of a, a a time of androgyny in which, you know, women don't want to be women and men don't want to be men and, and we're told that either can be can be either or can be both in the case of a single parent. And all of that comes together to in is evidenced when it comes together, uh, as wrong, right? Because it's it's wrong when you see the results of it. And the results are so incredibly manifest in the sort of things that you're talking about. And yeah, you, you do see uh especially like, you know, the, the self-proclaimed feminists on college campuses and so on, they do not seem like happy people, I will say that much. You know, they're, they're some like seriously angry, uh, volatile people who can be uh, set off very rapidly, who are emotionalistic, who are uh, just quite literally not in control of themselves. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, you do see that, and they don't appreciate it when you ask what their relationship with their fathers is like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm I'm working on my next book right now, which I'm going to be calling "Not Just for Kings: Founding Families for the Ages." Oh, wow. um, you know how how the landed, the nobles, you know the. Uh, 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 are able to maintain, project their family through time because they have something to protect, you know, a title, right. land, so on and so forth. But you see, this thing is for all of us. And what I'm doing here is I'm interviewing a lot of families here in Northern Virginia who have this hundred year vision for their families. And, you know, it, it's an amazing community here in Northern Virginia because there are hundreds of mission oriented families um, who live here they're intermarrying, you know, they're having, I think one of the keys is they're having uh, as many children as God wants them to have, right. you know, in some cases two, in some cases 10. Um, and, and, and one of the common denominators of all of this is the joy that they present to the world. Uh, and in the, at the end of the day, I think that this is what's going to save us is that, you know, faithful Catholics continuing to have as many children as God wants them to have and intermarrying and spreading out, you know? Yeah. Uh, the other side aren't really making many kids. Or is that? 
Um, but no, uh, no. I, I do want to ask: Do you think that the willingness to sort of allow um, the conservative movement to be sort of infiltrated uh, by these elements? Do you think that's due to conservatives now failing to believe what they used to believe, or do you think it's cowardice, or just the fact that they think that we've already lost the battle, therefore you might as well cede it? Like, where does this come from? This idea that you know, oh, it's perfectly fine. Yes, he's a he, he's faux married, you know, to a man, but he can go ahead and and, and lead up our, our organization and what have you. You know, I think it's because uh, the uh, the mainstream conservative movement believes that this whole fight is over, uh, that, you know, we, we lost it with Obergefell and we just need to move on. Um, you know, people that I deeply admire who were major spokesmen during during the fight for uh, uh, leading up to Obergefell have said, you know, there is no there is no taste for overturning Obergefell. Therefore, it's over. Now, one of the mistakes that I think that our side made in in the marriage debates is not talking about homosexuality per se. Right. You know, the top line message was children need moms and dads. Um, at the end of the day, that was a failing message. Um, what 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 ought to have worked. Uh, what ought to have been tried, and I think it was tried in some states. I mean, we won 32 statewide races, yeah. but it was where the argument was made that this is not a proper understanding of human sexuality, that homosexuality acted upon is disordered. Um, you know, no mother and father, well, this, this may be different. I think that no father celebrates the day that his son says that he wants to be with other men. Um, and, and this is one of the things that I think we have to talk about, um, should have talked about in the run up to Obergefell, should have talked about more, should continue talking about it more. But now I think that, golly, you know, these guys are, you know, Douglas Murray wrote a book about saving Western civilization. Right. So did Spencer Clavin. And left out. You know, um, left out sex, and, and, and these revolution. guys are, you know, as I say about, about Barry Weiss, I mean, they're sexual revolutionaries. Yeah. Um, how can a sexual revolutionary save Western civilization? is the question. Right, yeah, I don't see that being possible. Oh yeah, well to introduce a bit of a, a devil's advocate, because I think that makes it more interesting, there was a, when I posted your video out on my social media, it's, your, sorry, your article out on my social media, I got, you know, varied responses, mostly positive because the people who follow my work, but there was uh, one which I think sort of is representative of so many. I'll see if I can pull it on the screen and I'll also read it along. It says, whatever happened to love the sinner, but not the sin or the sinner's lifestyle? I can accept someone who is conservative and for Israel without condoning their sexual choices and way of living. In other words, I have a liberal friend who's an extreme leftist, but I do not accept his crazy leftist views and leftist support or green energy. In order to be a conservative, do I have to shun him? What Austin Ruse is saying is that you have to accept not only the views, but also the way of living to accept that person into your movement. I can understand if the person was a pedophile or a sexual predator, you want nothing to do with a criminal. Okay, what do you think? Well, you know, uh, of course that is a common, a, a common argument. Um, I think that, I think that they should not be running conservative organizations. Right. You know, um, uh, you know, my favorite homosexual. <laughs> was Justin Raimondo. <laughs> do, do, do you, you're probably too, too, too young, young to yeah, remember sorry. Justin Raimondo. Justin Raimondo, he just died a couple of years ago. He, he had this uh, website called antiwar.com, which is really good. Um, yeah. You know, it's against, he's, he was against all that. war. He uh -huh. was a libertarian. And he said, yeah, that, that was Justin okay, Raimondo. He wrote that. a wonderful book maybe 15, 20 years ago about uh, the paleoconservative movement. You know, so he was a paleoconservative. Okay. Um, but he was a homosexual. And he said he he resented the the sort of aggressive homosexual movement that mainstreamed everything because he said one of the great things about homosexuality was all the sneaking around, <laughs> which which I, I I really appreciate. Right. And and now it's like white picket fences and things like that. Um, so you know I, I I think that it's you know what it's a hard question. I don't know if I really have an answer. I'll to tell that you what, what, what I don't think that they can run our organizations. They can't be presented as normal. Right. Well, yes, you, Douglas Murray, you can talk about Hamas, but we're not going to accept your lifestyle. You know, and I, I was at the National Conservative Conference in Miami a few years ago, and Douglas Murray was on stage, and he sneered 
in in the most awful way about ha- how you know how can any adult care about what another another adult does with their genitalia right you know and and this kind of thing had not even come up it was like a non sequitur um and you know at the end of the day we don't really care you know um as i say and said in a piece about that you know you can stoop mud if you want to just don't tell us how wonderful it is right i mean it's unhealthy for society when you when you label yourself by it's also unhealthy for you and your soul but it's unhealthy for greater society when you identify yourself by your vices you know and the thing yeah. is that you're okay i think that people might understand it a little better if you make a parallel to a different sexual vice so for example right. like if a guy came up on stage and inv- you know described himself as an adulterer and then went on to give his speech about free speech like you see how like it would like muddy the entire <laughs> the entire thing because you're like That's well, right. why is this That's guy right. talking about moral issues he doesn't have any authority from which to to stand um and that's, that's one of the areas where i think it's just like we become so neutralized to the homosexual issue yeah. but you see some other you know sexual sins and it's like oh that 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 seems really immoral and with homosexuality it, it goes from one to so many because it's like if you accept homosexuality as just another orientation, which is the argument that's made today. Well, from there, uh, you can accept just about anything. Because the, the traditional view, as you alluded to earlier, was like there is one state of, of healthy sexuality, um, and everything else is is a type of disorder. Have, have you noticed how uh, some of the mainstream conservative homosexuals are uh, trying to distance themselves from uh, the transgender movement. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. I, which which I, I wrote a column not long ago, is that we cannot let them <laughs> separate the L, the Gs, and the T, but to, to, LGBs to, from the T. Yeah. They are the same, and we have to insist that they remain the same. But, you know, you have somebody like Andrew Sullivan and others saying, oh, no, 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 that's not really a part of, of who we are and what we are. But you know what? It is. Yeah. I mean, it all comes from the sort of same conclusion, um, but also in that in that same comment right there, it's the last sentence is, I can understand if the person was a pedophile or a sexual predator, you want nothing to do with a criminal. And there's something like really interesting about this, because it's, it's, it's the sort of passing off morality onto the justice system. And, oh, right. and traditionally we would say, well, we will make certain things illegal because they are not moral it's not they're not moral because they're illegal if you follow <laughs> it's right yeah um but that's the the sort of modern view is that whatever is criminal is immoral and whatever is is lawful is is moral and that's where you kind of get some confusion you know and when, whenever people make that argument i like to point about, out the fact that before lawrence v texas most of the states uh, uh outlawed sodomy so you know right that was okay with you then, right? Well, as a matter of fact, it wasn't. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a sticky wicket, and there are darn few of us who are willing to talk about this. You know, it's funny. I'm a little bit like Nicodemus. Uh, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I'm a little bit like Christ with Nicodemus coming to me in the night. Okay. It's like so many people come to me with emails saying, "I'm really glad you're doing this," and "I'm really glad you're saying this," but they don't, and that's fine. I get that. Too. I mean, that's totally fine. <laughs> I, I understand. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, uh, you know, there's a piece that I'd like to submit to the Claremont Review of Books, and I know that I can't at this point, you know, criticizing Spencer Clavin for his lifestyle. Uh, even though he's not the head poobah there, you know, he is right. one of the top editors. So it, it's like, I'm old enough, not really, you know, and I've been working on these issues for so long. Uh, you know, my organization, CFAM, we've been, we've been lobbying on these issues since 1997, you know, and we've blocked a sexual orientation and gender identity from becoming a, a, new, a new protected category in uh, in international law. For we've blocked it for 27 years. So I'm I'm already blacklisted. You know, I'm I'm my organization is on the Southern Poverty Law Center hate list. Congratulations! Not everybody. Can, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> One day Not I'll be there. <laughs> Gotta have goals, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, but not everybody's willing to go that far, you know, and, and people say, well, what should I do? And I say, you know, write a check, you know, um, do, do what you can, right. you know, um, like my wife uh, has spent years 
even before COVID and even before the the, uh, the whole trans thing exploded on the national stage via the local school boards, my wife and her friends were down at the Fairfax County School Board every other week for a couple of years uh, giving little speeches on, on the transgender policy. So do that. And you know what? If you can't do that, go down and shake somebody's hand who is making that kind of speech. You know what I mean? Right. It's like everybody can charge the sniper's nest in their own way. If you've seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, uh, most guys have, not all not all have. women have, have. But you have. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Yes. Uh, <laughs> The scene where uh, where uh, animal mother, you know, cowboy says you, you 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 cannot refuse to accept the situation. Well, animal mother says, oh, yes, I can refuse to accept the situation. And he jumps over the wall and he charges the sniper's nest. We're all called to charge the sniper's nest, sometimes like animal mother, sometimes in, in other ways, you know, uh, more hidden. But we're all called to charge the snipers, the cultural snipers. And they're everywhere. Yes. Yes, they are. I wonder if the influx of sort of, they often call themselves ex-liberals, but it's they're not ex-liberals, they're liberals who are ex-democrats um, into the conservative movement because the, the American left has gone so far mm. left that they're no longer liberal. And so we've got like liberals who are calling themselves conservatives, causing the, the conservative movement to move further left as a result. Mm. And I do wonder if that's created a large part of the problem because I mean, to be a conservative is not supposed to be to be a classical liberal. And yet that's sort of, that's right. so it seems to be where we, we find ourselves. I mean, you've got people like Dennis Prager, for example, who will just come out and say, no, I'm not a conservative. I'm a classical liberal. But most people consider him to be, you know, a, a conservative and, and leading a, a pretty large uh, conservative organization, Prager U. You know, there, I, I wrote about this some months ago um, about some of these people coming over. And I, I can't remember the guy's name. He's Jewish. Uh, first name is Leev, L-I-E-V, and I can't remember his last name. Anyway, he, he's now a regular contributor to First Things. So, the, the, so you know, point well made. Is he all, Can one be considered a conservative if you accept the sexual revolution is the question. And so, you know, this guy may be good on Israel, of course, on free speech. Uh, you know, the free speech issue has been an avenue for a lot of liberals to come yeah. our way because they see what's happening. But they, it seems to me that we have to convince them to leave behind the rest of the issues that they that they may believe, believe in. I mean, abortion is one of them. Right. You know, um, uh, you know, and, and maybe they won't go as far as we do with regard to, for instance, contraception, you know, which is practically a sacrament. Um, yeah. And as as we know, you know, you know, uh, among the very beginning of all of this was, you know, um, you know, the world changed in October 1959 yeah. when um, w one of these companies applied for FDA approval for the for the contraceptive pill. That was the really ground zero of the sexual revolution. And maybe they're not going to go that far. But I mean, you and I know right. that that that's at the heart of so much of this. It is. Um, but and yet. We can't. I mean, I just kind of feel like the the argument is being made that what we need is volume, just like more people is is an inherent mm -hmm. good. And I think that more people who don't acknowledge that the sexual revolution um, is is a problem or is the problem, because uh, from where I'm sitting, um, the foreign policy isn't anywhere near as big of an issue. Tax rates and and everything they're not as big of issues as the fact that our civilization is going to fall because it's, it's going to fall due to uh, you know the dissolution of the family that gets rid of any sort of semblance of culture that we have like it's going to die from the inside far far faster than it's going to die from without um and to me that that couldn't be clearer i do wonder like like do you think it's possible to reignite conservatism as traditionalism without it being a faith-based movement Oh, golly, that is a really good question. And I don't think I have an answer for that. What what, what do you say? I, I don't think so. Because, I mean, I, I mean, I guess it's it's possible to be sort of an agnostic, but then recognize that the Christian values um, are inherent, are, are needed foundationally. Um, I guess you could mm -hmm. perhaps take that, but you just don't quite have the, the gift of faith yet. Um, at that point, yeah. I think you'd have to take sort of like a Pascal's wager at some point. But anyway, th there's maybe that. 
but I don't. But I think that conservatism is faith-based, at least was when it was conservatism, because th what you're conserving are <laughs> values that are rooted in the Christian faith. Like, I mean, yeah, and and therefore. I, I kind of wonder, like, can you get con conservatism back without some sort of um, reignition to, in that direction? Like, and an, an actual acknowledgement, because now so many conservatives are trying to, like, not mention the fact that they're even, you know, Christian, whether they're Catholic or not, but, like, even Christian, they're not willing to, to say that because then people might stop listening to them because it's not, or they don't think it's, it's def is defensible or something like that. You know, it, well, here's the question. Ha have we been hurt by um, uh, the, the aspects of the pro-family movement going back to, you know, people like Jerry Falwell and, and Pat Robertson? I mean, they, often people point to those guys mm -hmm. as things that have really harmed that aspect of, of conservatism, you know, that part of the three-legged stool. Uh, I mean, at the time, they were extremely important in pushing back on a lot of these issues, but their presentation was sometimes, I guess, a little bit harsh. I mean, I'm accused of that too. Me too. So, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is a really big question as to what religion, you know, uh, you know, it, 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 what religion do we urge to get back involved in, in conservatism? Um, and, and, and in what way, uh, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing. And, and, and then among conservatives, um, you can have, uh, I mean, among Catholics, you can have, you know, Dorothy Day types right. who can be quite good on abortion and contraception and all of those things. Uh, but who may be really bad on, I don't know, taxation or something. I care less about that at just like you. Right. Um, and, 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 and quite honestly, um, Donald Trump changed me with regard to foreign policy issues. I'm I'm now practically a peacenik, you know. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Is, I isn't it weird how he, he how he reshuffled the deck? He he gave us permission to dislike what George Bush did in Iraq. Yeah, yeah. Um, his his complete rejection of neoconservatism in terms of you know foreign policy was fabulous, um, I thought. The fact that yeah. he, he wasn't willing to sort of be get, get dragged into what M McCain and Bush and all of that were, were part of. Did your views change on, on these things because of Trump, or were you always I, I was, a little bit of a peacenik? I, I was always a little bit that way. Um, I, I did get pulled more in the area of, of tariffs. I wasn't sure that they would actually work. But I started to see them work um, toward the to, toward the end of Trump's uh, reign. I, I was I was thrilled with that, and he certainly emboldened. I think my views that were a little bit tepid before then in terms of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Are you um, supporting him again? Uh, probably only in a <laughs> uh, only in a best of bad options kind of a way. Um, perhaps, yeah, yeah. but the way that he dealt with, uh, COVID, I thought was, I thought was horrible. Um, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I, th I thought that was horrible. I, I didn't like the way that he was so wishy-washy on some really big issues like gun rights when he was like, we'll take the guns first, uh, due process later, things like that, I think can, um, yeah, yeah. you know, so these things just like jump out at me. And the fact that he he doesn't actually lead from the front in terms of culture like well you know, you know like, he's look, he's really bad on lgbt but you know, i was gonna say and, you know you look uh, at the the abortion yeah. issue which he criticized after the midterms that we were being you know too uh too anti-abortion um that kind yeah. of stuff i just when i when i put it all together it's like goodness could he really be the best option you know so so that's interesting. The position that you take is 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 really on questions of policy and not personality. Correct. Um, you know, a lot of people just say, you know, he's he's so icky. And, no, I uh, I, you know, I like that the fact of... that in terms of personality, he's he's willing to be be aggressive and be hated. Um, I actually think that, that yeah. we need more of that of people who just do not care um, <laughs> about that. Right. Uh, right. I, I care about you what know, he the, does. The other thing about yeah. the other thing about him is that uh, he actually makes me laugh. Yes. 
Yeah, he's I mean, funny. With him. Yes. Like like the other night with with Hannity, where he said he'll he'll be a dictator on day on, on the first day. Right. You know, that was hilarious. And everybody got it. Right. You know, except the mainstream media. <laughs> yeah, he, he has actually always been funny. And that's just part of his personality is the, the more aggressive thing. Yeah. I think it tends to be comical. Some people find it horrifying. But <laughs> in, in, in my book, uh, The Catholic Case for Trump, um, I write about his uh, He's got a real Jewish sense of humor. You know, it, it's like he grew up on work sites in New York City, you know, right. and he hung out with, you know, New York is very Jewish. And, and he he has the, the comedic patter of a Catskill comedian. And a lot of people miss that. OK, fair enough. I'm not particularly familiar with, with Jewish humor. I mean, I'm British, so um, my, my humor is just dry. <laughs> but all right. You, you should see the um, and well, at, you know, actually, you may scold me for this because uh, there are some sexual revolutionary aspects to this show. But the marvelous Mrs. Maisel okay. is a remarkable television show, and it's about Jewish comedians in New York City. That's all I'm going to say. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'll take a look. Right, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. <laughs> I, I, I love the, uh, the conversation that we had. And there are so few people who are willing to talk about these important issues. Uh, where can people find your work, Austin? Well, I, I write a column every other week at uh, Crisis Magazine, so uh, they can just look up my columns. Uh, got several hundred columns there. Uh, CrisisMagazine.org. My organization is called CFAM. C dash F A M. Uh, our website is C dash F A M. dot O R G. And uh, my day job is uh, fighting the sexual revolutionaries at the UN. And man, do they hate us! <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your good work. <laughs> Eddie, thank you so much for having me. All right, bye-bye. Hey, you're still here. Don't forget to give the video a like. Subscribe if you haven't already and share it with your friends. I've also got links in the description as to how you can help support my work. Thank you so much.